Directed by Danny Villeneuve, Dune Part Two, starring Timothy Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, Oscar Isaac, Josh Brolin, Dave Bautista, Zenda, and Javier Bardem in the lead roles, is finally released on the big screen. As the fantasy sci-fi action film is finally released, we thought this would be the perfect time to discuss what to expect from the third part of the film series, so that you can have the best viewing experience. A spoiler warning is in order, as we will be discussing essential plot points and character details from the movie. But if you are done watching it already, let's dive straight into the video. And yeah, while you're at it, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps us a lot. Thank you, and let's move on to how the film ended. The Southern Freeman leaders hope that Paul will challenge Tilgar for leadership, but Paul denounces this speculation. Eventually, he accepts his messianic destiny, declaring himself as a Lisan al Gaib. and refusing to eliminate a great fighter like Stilgar by force. He compares the silly act to breaking a good night before a fight and assumes full power over the freemen and challenges the emperor who arrives on Arrakis with Irulan Mohiam and his Sadukar forces. As in the novel the film ends with Emperor Shaddam arriving on Arrakis to deal with the freemen uprising and chastise the Harkonnens for not doing his dirty work. It was Paul who sent him a message as Muad'Dib and asked him to come to Arrakis to resolve the situation. He interrupts the emperor's confrontation with the Baron by firing nuclear warheads at the Arakan fortress. Then riding the Shai Huluds, the freemen overwhelm Sadugar's forces and breach Arakan's defenses. If you are wondering what everyone is talking about when they refer to bringing sandworms and atomic explosives together to destroy the shield wall, well that is not a force field shield but rather a natural wall of rocks that protects this particular part of Arakan with the most brutal climate of the rest of the planet. And finally Gurney kills a fleeing Raban and like in the book Paul's army is reinforced by Freeman Southern fundamentalists a concept that reinforces the religious devotion of his followers in the book the distinction between the different beliefs between the northern freemen and the southern freemen was invented solely for the film once the capital is taken Paul kills the baron which basically means he killed the person who is the current chief of Arrakis completing his revenge for the death of his father by killing his maternal grandfather In the book Alia killed the Baron but in this version she isn't even born yet. He then orders the emperor along with his forces to be transported to the residency. There he threatens to destroy the spice forever unless the emperor surrenders. Paul then claims that he is still the Duke of Arrakis because technically the invasion of Arrakis that massacred his family was illegal. Paul also says that he will take the throne by marrying Princess Irulan by proclaiming this Paul intends to tell them that he has control of the grass. The de facto heir of the Harkonnens is then called upon to fight as the emperor's champion carrying his blade, meaning that if Paul kills Feid, he will gain the throne by proxy. In the book this feudal tradition is called Calle and is a way in which major disputes between the great houses are resolved through knife duels. Paul defeats Feid and wins Arrakis and the throne. Having no other choice, Shaddam abandons the imperial throne and Paul takes Irulan as his wife. But Paul's victory at Calle does not mean that the other great houses accept his accession to the throne. During Paul's duel with Feid Rauta, all the great houses of the empire was waiting in orbit around Arrakis, summoned by the emperor. When Paul kills Feid Rauta, he orders Gurney to inform the great houses that he is their new ruler. But Gurney returns with the message that the great houses refuse to honor his superiority. This prompts Paul to order his freemen army to send them to heaven. Paul's declaration of cold-blooded war against the great houses who refuse to bow down to him as emperor shows how far he has come. He sends the freemen into a bloody holy war in his name, which as his vision showed him would only lead to devastation across the galaxy. But after drinking the water of life, Paul's devotion to the narrow path to victory made him once again determined to take back the empire, and he doesn't care how many freemen die in his name. Jessica and her unborn daughter believe this is the start of Muad'Dib's holy war. Upset by his decisions, Chani leaves with tears in her eyes and prepares to ride a sandworm elsewhere. However, the film begs to differ from the book in this segment, as Paul is now doing well as the Fremen wage their bloody holy war. Technically, this holy war takes place between the Dune and Dune Messiah books, which appears to be the case in the film version as well. In the sense the ending of the film is very similar to the book in which we understand that Paul has won but that this comes at a high cost unlike the book the final moments of Dune part 2 focus on Chani setting off alone into the desert of Arrakis 
Chani prepares her maker hooks, which the Fremen use to ride the sandworms, and we are led to believe that she too rejects Paul's crazy power plea. Previously, Jessica told Paul that she feels sorry for Chani, meaning she feels sorry for Paul that Chani is basically dumping him because he decided to go down the path of a bloodthirsty religious fanatic as she definitely did not sign up for that. But at that moment, Paul tells his mother that she will eventually understand it. This seems to foreshadow the events of Dune Messiah, the second novel, which takes place more than a decade later, in which Chani gives birth to Paul's twin Saleto II and Ganima. In this book, Chani dies in childbirth and is faithful to Paul until the end. The ending of Dune Part 2 faithfully reflects the events of the book, which like a breach through the shield wall, seems to open a clear path to Dune 3. And if Dune 3 happens, the changes big and small in Dune Part 2 could result in a very different fate for House Atreides, the Fremen and the Iraqi saga. According to Frank Herbert's Dune novel titled Dune Messiah, the next part will begin 12 years after the events of the first book and in this dark future, 61 billion people have died because of Paul's religious cult. He is anything but happy about it and regrets many of his past decisions. However, his problem is that if he abandons the war, he will appear weak and his power may collapse and if he dies, he will become a martyr. What follows is quite complicated, so we will do our best to keep it simple. Princess Erulan, played by Florence Pugh in the film, who is in a political marriage to Paul, will probably begin secretly administrating contraceptives to Chani. Paul would not want to have a child with Erulan, so she will probably start worrying about her place in his government. Erulan is also allied with the Bene Gesserit, who intends to continue the treaty's line through her son. But the Bene Gesserit are also working with other factions against Paul. However, Paul is aware of Irulan's maneuvers, since he had previously had a vision showing that Chani would die if she had his child. Chani will later become pregnant anyway after changing her diet, so Irulan will stop giving her the contraceptive, but taking it for such a long time will endanger the pregnancy anyway. Meanwhile, Paul will receive a cola, a clone of his old pal Duncan Idaho played by Jason Momoa, but it will actually be a pretty sinister gift. This Duncan would have been programmed to kill Paul. Another attack will blind Paul, but thanks to his psychic powers, he will be able to see by experiencing visions of the world around him. Essentially, he will constantly observe the present moment psychically. Chani will later die giving birth to twins, a boy and a girl. Paul was not planning for a son, only a daughter. After Chani's death, the clone Duncan will attempt to assassinate Paul. However, in doing so, he will eventually regain consciousness of Duncan. Another attack on Paul will leave him without his prophetic visions, so following Fremen tradition, he will go into exile in the desert as a blind man. It is unknown whether he will live or die, although everyone assumes that he will end up dead. It's also a neat solution to Paul's biggest dilemma. By disappearing like this, he will no longer be as impressive as a savior figure. Paul's exile will ensure that the Fremen will continue to support his children. Paul's sister Alia, seen briefly in Dune 2 and played by Anya Taylor-Joy, will probably serve as a regent while the twins named Leto and Ganima are still too young to rule and she will also begin a romance with Duncan. While Alia will execute some of Paul's enemies, she will not harm Irulan, who will renounce the Perejacidate and instead will pledge allegiance to Paul's twins. This is where the novel ends and will probably happen in Vilnius Dune 3 as well, although the story continues in several other books. The second part of Jenny Villeneuve's monumental adaptation of Dune is another epic science fiction hallucination whose images speak of fascism and imperialism, of guerrilla warfare and romance and feels like a shroom trip. Villeneuve's adaptation of Frank Herbert's 1965 novel in collaboration with co-writer John Spate is majorly inspired by the works of David Lynn, George Lucas and Ridley Scott but he made it about himself through his political comments and striking imageries. Those outside of the existing Dune fanbase may feel that the ending does not provide the resounding conclusion that we are all perhaps naively entitled to at the end of the 3.30 minutes of total screen time, and the film's eventful final moments feel a little rushed. None of this, however, detracts from the film's style and extraordinary performances. We begin with another stunning and surreal desert battle scene with technological details so impressively fabricated and clearly terrifying as if we were witnessing the next evolutionary development. The characteristics, designs and accents are presented with absolute confidence. The film is a triumph for director of photography Greek Fraser and production designer Patrice Vermet. Hans Zimmer's code provides just the right tone both melancholy and grandiose. Villeneuve successfully demonstrate his ambition, audacity and true cinematographic language. 
The Revere director handles the movie with extreme care, exactly as he had done with Blade Runner 2049. Timothy Chalamet is incredible raw and real in the role of Paul Atreides. As a leading man, he was perfect. Zendaya, Rebecca Ferguson, Javier Burdum and Josh Brolin are fantastic as always. Stellan Skarsgård and Jeep Batista continue their menacing role with perfection. However, it is Austin Butler who steals the show as Fade Rauta and Florence Pugh and Christopher Walken are solid new additions to the already supremely talented cast. Overall, Dune Part 2 is an inspiring, visually stunning sci-fi spectacle and an incredible collision of myth, adventure and destiny on a galactic scale. It's a fantastic film, the likes of which we rarely see in modern cinema. However, I have one small complaint is that Villeneuve should have been more careful about the action choreography which could have been much better for a film of this caliber. Hey hey hey, thank you for watching this video, do share your thoughts in the comment section about your experience of watching Dune part 2, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get your weekly dose of cinema series. See you at the next one and for the timing we are signing off, Cheerio, power over spices, power over all and I'll be back.